Geoffrey Whiteley. Uh, I played with the band in the 1950s. Uh, born in Queensbury, lived in Queensbury all my life, and had a very strong connection with the band from a very early age of about 10. I was fortunate enough to go for lessons with the famous cornet player of the band in the 1920s, Harold Pinchers, who tragically died while he was, um, I was in the process of going to him for lessons, although I wasn't there at the time. Uh, and he did leave a lasting impression on me as to how you should approach life in general. You must always keep trying. Uh, it wouldn't let you play a tune. You had to play scales from the Arban. And at that time, just after the war, you could not get music or anything, instruments. And I went to Harold for lessons uh, for about four or five weeks before. And he used to write out manuscript exercises from memory from the Arban. And I had to learn those. And I can remember going the, on the Sunday morning to find out whether he would take me for lessons. And I went into his uh, front room in Russell Avenue and he was talking in front of the window with my father. I was sat on the settee facing the fireplace which had a clothes horse around it and behind the clothes horse was his young son Jack, the trombone player. And Harold gave me a piece of paper, just a small slip of paper and I didn't know what it did, some lines on it and some no letters. Um, and after a while he took it from me and said, right, what's the note on the first line? I hadn't a clue. He didn't say memorise this or whatever. And I thought, jingo, I'm going to fail at the first. And I looked across and behind the clothesline horse, Jack went, E. And I said, E. And then he asked me some more and looked at Jack and F and so on. Oh, he says, let him start on Monday. He's going to be a natural. And ever afterwards, of course, Jack became principal trombone player of the BBC Symphony Orchestra. And whenever they were on television, I used to look at Jack and think, if you hadn't been there that day, I might never have got started into music. I think it was important at the time, of course, <laughs> at that time, in the late 1940s, there was not a lot of, there were no uh, iPads and e-pods and fancy phones, etc. So you were very limited in a village, Queensbury, 1100 feet above sea level, uh, with you know whatever you want to do. So it was a natural thing. Of course, the band held a strong uh, feeling right away through the village and I never knew until long after my father had passed away that the, some fathers want their sons to play for England at football or cricket or whatever. He always wanted a son to play in Black Dyke Band but he never told me and I never knew that. Dad was a pond dasher, of course you know the pond dasher is an avid supporter of Black Dyke Band uh, and we used to come into the band room here uh, and I can remember coming in so I think it was the t first time I heard him was on Rhapsody on the Cornish Coast by Henry Gale. And it was, they were just going off to London, at which they won on it. Um, and ever after that, I used to come into the band room. It wasn't like it is now. It was just a pure basic rehearsal place. Not you know, in any way, <laughs> well, it was just purely and simple to put your notes down. Uh, but it, it just was enthralling to me. And that's how I really became involved. I think this is one of the most important things of all. Uh, John Foster, in my view, and the research I've done, was a very, very enterprising man. Um, and of course, it, it was William Congreve in the 1600s said that music hath charms to through the savage breast. And, and at the time, the Chartists were creating revolts and headaches for all the mill owners in around here. And I, Foster, along with one or two others, decided to think, let's get some music into it. He did play in the Queen's Head Band uh, for a short time, which was a small group of musicians in the village which it fell into decline. Uh, and I could understand why, when you bear in mind that the only things that was happening around here industry-wise was some drift mines, clay mines into the hillside, one or two small coal mines, hill farming, which was very difficult. So how they actually scraped up money to buy instruments in the first place, I don't know. But Foster did form the, he took the Queen's Head Band over and formed it. And ever since then, in my lifetime, the Fosters were always predominant in the, in the, in the band and, and in its future. And, and when you look at 1906, they went to a, a you know, three months tour of Canada and North America, uh, going over on the maiden voyage of the Empress of Ireland, which with our, we have a liaison here, uh, our friends in the Salvation Army, some of the older members will know that the Empress of Ireland was in a tragic 
tragic uh, shipping accident out the Salon Seaway and a tremendous amount of a thousand or more Salvationists who were coming to London lost their lives on it. So that was a rather sad situation. But the Fosters were involved. Yes, they did contest, but they also did a tremendous amount of concerts. Uh, and that was always in the forefront. Uh, if you look at uh, the situation where, uh, socially in the village, it was always involved with the village. The band was involved and, and people who lived in the Queensbury, some weren't interested in music, but they always felt a strength with the band. Uh, and uh, in, in the boardroom, in fact, the, the, the windows were all frosted apart from one, which looks down the yard. And the window was being raised by about six inches so that any trophy that the band did win could be displayed there and all the people coming would look up and say, oh, we, we've won another cup. Uh, and this gives pride to people. Uh, and I think he also suspected, because in my opinion, um, we talk about the choirs in South Wales, we talk about uh, brass bands in the north of England. And why would this be so? And, and in my opinion, probably people working extremely hard sometimes find it difficult to show emotion and music is the way that they can portray it. And I do feel that Foster spotted this, and of course, it gave the mill some kudos in the success of the band. Yeah, I think this was, we'd had a, we'd, I think we'd gone three or four years, we'd not been particularly successful at contests. We'd had some really good concerts, and, and as usual, we had full audiences. Um, and then we played at, uh, in Norwich, uh, at an annual concert thing there at springtime and the guest conductor who had been the adjudicator there was George Wilcox and I remember uh, Maurice Murphy at the interval chatting with George Wilcox and asking if he'd think of, of conducting Black Dyke and he agreed to do this and he came and um, that stood out him this was a fantastic man he first of all memorized everybody's name so instead of being second baritone or first baritone or trauma, you were Jeffrey or Brian or Ian or whatever. And uh, he also memorised the score. And he would look at you and suggest the piece should go this way or that way. And if you went home and practised it while he were conducting the piece, he'd give you a smile that you'd done it. But if you hadn't done it, you'd regret that. But he was a fantastic musician. Um, and I remember he used to regale us with an odd story or two. Um, uh, and one of them, I remember him telling us that he was a conductor of the Irish Guards Band and they were down on one of the bandstands on the south coast and uh, he'd got it all organised, as Major Wilcox, that the band would come on from uh, sort of three minutes to three from each side or whatever and he would walk the full length of this in his full regalia with the best and his sword and everything and it, we'd all get there at exactly three o'clock, precise. And he said that he got about two or three rows from the front. And he'd come across the first northern person he'd ever come across. And he said, well, go on then, lad, I will have a programme. <laughs> and of course, that brought the house down. <laughs> and George said, well, you know, what can you do? <laughs> so, yeah, I remember him. And we won that day. Uh, and, and the performance, anybody over there will tell you, it was fantastic. In, in my early days, in, and even now, uh, and it, well, it proves it, if you, if you go uh, put a notice outside the Queensby Church to say that, you know, the band was performing, straight away, you know, 300 tickets or whatever it's always just go. Uh, it was a big involvement because at that time, in the sort of 40s, 50s, into the 60s, uh, people, quite a lot of the band worked at the mill, um, and people in the village worked at the mill. I mean, when I was in the band in the 50s, there was nearly 3,000 people who worked there. 2,600 perhaps, or seven months or that. So, so there was a tremendous involvement. And, and there was a pride in, in uh, I think I'm just right in saying, yeah, um, out of 20, 26, 27 players at that time, something like 20 came from within a mile or two of the band room. So it was a tremendous connection where everybody knew somebody who played in the band. Uh, well, it has to be Maurice Murphy for lots of reasons. Apart from being a great guy, he was a fantastic musician. Uh, his ability to, to just perform continuously at the highest standard is unbelievable. And Geoffrey Whittemon, Euphonium, um, 
trombone players, Golly Monk was a young lad, he, he, he was a gone trombone. One of the best players, I, and I sat by the side of him, was Gordon Sutcliffe. And these were on the small bore instruments, and he couldn't get a sound out of a tenor horn, which sometimes people would mistake for baritone. He had a tremendous... Iona was the favourite um, tenor horn solo that uh, Gordon was particularly good at. It, it, it used to bring tears to your eyes. And we had a, 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 a spate in the 50s, and of course, Harry Mortimer was um, the guest conductor of the band, um, and we went to uh, the Albert Hall, the test brief was Blackfriars, and um, at that time, Harry, out of the champion section bands, he conducted five bands in the same contest. Black Dyke, Fordham's Motor Works, Ferry Aviation, Morris Motors and Munn and Felton's. And I do have to say, uh, really, um, it was an uncomfortable time in the fact that when you go on stage and you know that the man in the middle has interests in another four bands beside you, it really takes a bit of overcoming. I'm not right keen on that at all. And uh, as it happened on the day, he won with Munn and Felton's and then we were the next place band that he had. The others didn't come anywhere. But nevertheless, th that was something that I do remember was a bit of a... We didn't have rehearsal before and I remember <laughs> it was said that um, we were having a rehearsal Sunday morning because Mr Mortimer was going to fly up. Now, in the early 50s, not many people flew anywhere for a band practice. And uh, one of the members, who shall remain nameless, says, oh, that means he's not coming then. And so, now, 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 don't be like that. But he didn't turn up. So, yeah, that, that was a bit of a low point. As far as I'm concerned, you know, great musician, I'm not decrying, but it did play the, you know. I think, in a way, that it, there was a purpose to do something. And, and they say profit in his own land, don't they? When, when you get away from Queensbury, the further away from Queensbury you go, and the more popular Black Dyke Band is, and it's popular in Queensbury, but we would go to, I remember the first concert I did was at Birmingham Town Hall. And after rehearsal, Harry Mortimer was a guest conductor, and I seem to remember a singer was Robert Easton and, and Gwen Catley. And we uh, went across to a um, Lion's Corner House or whatever for a drink of tea. And I remember seeing this massive queue around the town hall. And everybody assumed wrestling was all the thing at that time, just coming on the black and white telly. And everybody assumed that um, there was a wrestling match on. It was only when we got back to the town hall that we found that there was about a hundred waiting for tickets to come back. It was a total sellout. <laughs> so that was a big uh, surprise to me with that. I think it's always important that there has to be a front runner uh, or something for people to aim to, but that doesn't mean to say that that should always be so if the skill's not there and if the performances aren't good. So it's, it's a dual edge thing really. It's up to the players and the management of the band to maintain the standard. Uh, but having said that, I think it's, it's good to have a top flight group. When I um, came back, uh, I came to, I called in the band room to organise a concert for charity, and this would be 1994-ish, I think, somewhere, 93, and Jim Watson asked me if I would act as an administrator, administrator for the band that had experience, etc. And uh, we went, and, and Jim Watson was one of the best frontmen on the stage. He had a presence, and he lifted it up from the cracker gag not a Bahame that uh, normally prevailed with some. And, and he lifted it to a level, and I could see, particularly when I went to abroad to Switzerland and places in Denmark and Norway and Sweden uh, and Germany and France, he had a new audience. The audience, the average age of the audience, particularly in some of the Scandinavian countries, is about 30 or less. And that, that surprised me. And I could see that. Uh, yes, contests, you know, but I could see that the concerts constructed with the right sort of music could be there, that there was interest for that. So, uh, yeah, uh, definitely, I'm not saying stop contests, but it's not the be-all and end-all. We've got to look at the music that people want to listen to. If you give them music they want to listen to, they will come. You're only as good as your last concert, you know. 
I think for anybody starting out now, it's probably the most difficult time in history because there are so many distractions. There are so many little things you can get playing and get absorbed into, etc. And my advice would be, try not to be so ruled by it. Take up playing an instrument or something else. But certainly with music, if, even if you don't get to the top, you have a sudden knowledge of something which will last you for the rest of your life. But you must commit yourself. It's all about commitment. It's that odd time when you'd rather go and play soccer with your friends or you would rather go and get your iPad out. You've got to follow that, but you'll certainly appreciate the results. John Foster, a remarkable man, um, in my opinion, the research that I've done with it. Um, anybody can, can get more of this. There is a book. Uh, Black Knight Mills by Sigworth. It's a very rare book, and it's but it can be had in odd libraries, and it gives the full details of him. But he, he um, was a, only in his sort of twenty-one when he married Ruth Briggs, and Ruth, uh, when they got married in Halifax Parish Church, um, had to make a mark. She couldn't write her name, uh, as a lot of people did at that time. But they came. He'd built a house uh, on uh, Black Dyke Farm. Actually, it was Ruth. Uh, Briggs's father's farm and it was called Black Dyke Farm because as the water came down from the mountain top there at where the mill is now placed there was a quite a gorge and the water formed this dike in the bottom and of course looking down into it it was a like, like black water and it was Black Dyke it was a dike that and the Black Dyke mills and uh, John Foster started building a small mill uh, and he, he had Prospect House, which is straight across from the band room, um, and he lived there, and he had a warehouse at the side, and, and local weavers would weave in their houses and bring the stuff to him uh, on a regular basis. Um, then as the mill got on, he came up with the idea, so he gave these people four options. They could continue to weave in their cottages, they could come and bring their loom to his mill and rent some space and still weave them well. They could sell the loom to him and work for him, or they could come and work for him doing some other job. In other words, whatever they did was to please themselves, but Foster finished up with a cloth. And of course, this was something, and this was when he started uh, on, the, on the road with the, with the band, trying to get away from the, the violence of the Chartists, revolution, etc. and continually supported it. The, the, when you look that all these things were taking place before faxes and telecoms and emails etc and there's a traditional thing in a uh, story in, in um, Sigurd's history that uh, Foster uh, was a big weaver of alpaca as was Titus Salt, they were the two biggest and this chap who shipped it out from South America had a bright idea that he would, he had three cargoes of alpaca so he would sell one to Titus Salt, and he would sell one to Foster, and then he would sell one when they were on the way, on the high seas. They would sell one then to Titus Salt's customers and Foster's customers. Now, the only connection that was going at the time was the wool exchange in Bradford, and they used to meet on the Tuesday, whenever it was. And of course, whilst Titus Salt and Foster were competitors, a typical Yorkshire fashion, when money comes into it, your competition can be a friend, and. Uh, so there's a copy of two letters in Victorian florid lighting that, um, to this chap in South America, thank you for thinking about us in this wonderful time, uh, but we are well stocked with alpaca at the moment, but we do appreciate your giving us the first chance at this, but we're all right at the moment. In similar mode, there's a letter, not word for word, but from William Foster saying, you know, really appreciate your thank you very much, etc., etc. So this guy then has nowhere to go. The result is that we'll say it was, 20 pence a kilo at the time. Foster and Salt bought the lot for about eight pence. So, so you know, but, but this was enterprising stuff that Foster's were doing. And of course it expanded tremendously. Um, and and they, were, they were exporting to Italy and France and, and Belgium and Germany in, in the early 1800s. And the, the mill were getting into difficulties um, through imports and cheap imports, etc. Um, you know, I look back and it was a hundred and ten years or something like that, a long, it must be the longest sponsorship of any, any group, music or otherwise, in the world. 
you know, but to maintain a high standard. We, we gave a concert in Reith um, a few years back, which is a small village up in the Yorkshire Dales. And we were having a tea break and uh, the guy who was organising the concert came to me, so this is the man you need to see. And there was this elderly American chap uh, who was in his 80s and um, he said, you're the man, you're the guy. I said, I don't know, what do you want? If it's money, no. <laughs> and, uh, and oh, no, no, he says, your band came to America in 1906 and my father always said, if ever you get a chance to hear this band, you've got to hear them, they are good. He says, and here I am in North Yorkshire, you've got a concert and I can't get a ticket. So I, I arranged for him to sit just by the band and, and he enjoyed it. So that, I mean, 1906 to sort of 1995 or six, you know, I mean, that's 90 years away, you know. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was Foster's, uh, con the, the family, the whole family, that was their continued support. So, and I remember, um, there was a director, Arnold Sharp, who lived straight across from the band room in the terrace, you know, the house there. He started as an office boy and worked his way to being a director. And he used to come into the band room. If we were going to a contest, he would come into the band room and sit at the back there by the cupboards. And afterwards, um, he said, um, he would stand up and he said, well, gentlemen, because there were no ladies in the band at that time, uh, we, 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 on the behalf of the directors, we wish you well. Um, for the forthcoming contest tomorrow and, and we're sure you'll do your best and we're always with you. And the bass trombone player, David Summerskill, said, how about a set of trombones if we win tomorrow? So Arnold Sharp said, well, Mr. Summerskill, he said, I'm sure if the band needs a set of trombones, we'll certainly make sure they get them. And so David says, it's best advert you've ever had. And so Arnold smiled and he said, well, he said, you know, in a few weeks' time, he said, it's the International Cloth Exhibition in, in Canada. And we have taken two stands, two double stands, he says, and uh, we're rather proud of that. It's, it's a big display for us. He said, and in one corner, we do have a little display about the band and our history with it and how proud we are of it. By the same token, he said, I do have to tell you that, he says, there'll be buyers from all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, America, South America, Italy, France. He said, and they will come along, we will have cloth there, they will feel at the cloth, they will ask the delivery dates, the prices, the quality, can it be maintained, do a repeat order, etc., etc., etc. He said, and if we can get all those things right, they will place an order. But he said, I do have to say, having the band will not really sway them one way or the other if we can't get the figures right, but we're still very pleased with, to have the band and we are very, very proud of you and I do wish you all the best tomorrow. So, so that was the involvement of, of the Fosters with the band. Born in Norland was Willie, uh, or he lived in Norland, um, and he came to live in Queensbury and he, he sort of was uh, <laughs> attached to the band through that he worked for the mill as, as quite a few of the members did at that time and he was a stonemason. And, um, he, uh, as I say, no, I mean, he was in North Africa in a tank during the war, then he came back to be solo cornet player here. And uh, he built the, the score box at Queensbury Church there, you know. But I remember he, he came back and helped us with a job. Foster had a mill up in Cumnock in Scotland, and the Queen were visiting, so the, the director sent the ballot box up there, you know. And, and Willie came with us, and, and another old soprano cornet player, Buddy Burns, Bernard Burns, came. And I can remember, uh, I was only a young lad at the time, and. We were going out of Bradford and it was a bit dismal up a place called Laysterdyke, it's rather a heavy industrial area. And Bernard stood in front of the bus and Willie Lang and he said, now we're just passing through the sunspot of the north. And then they all lapsed into uh, descriptions that were passing. It was quite funny really, but, uh, and I remember uh, um, Willie, of course, um, he BBC Symphony Orchestra and I know he, he, he taught at um, Eton College and he used to go there as a sort of couple of days a week or something. But he always went to the tuck shop. And of course, he never lost his northern accent, didn't really. And uh, he chatted with the lady and, thank you very much, love these, the nice sweet humbugs these and that. So she says, tell me, she says, uh, do you teach here? He said, I do love English, <laughs> you know, which rather took a by surprise. Like, um, but, but yeah, and another great player, but a great guy, an ordinary, nice man. Donald Hansen is a name uh, that I admire. Um, it, it I don't know if it's peculiar to England or not, but we have this happy knack of 
the right person cropping up just at the right time, like Winston Churchill, for instance. And in Black Dyke Band, um, after the mill were in difficulties, uh, Donald Hanson, who was the chairman of the Bradford and Bingley Building Society at the time, he had friends on the board at Bradford and Bingley who were also directors at the mill. And they knew Donald had a, a, a passion for, for Black Dyke Band. And that, uh, after a board meeting one day, they said to him, your band's in difficulties, Donald, you know. Um, the mill is struggling and uh, things will have to happen there. Of course, Donald immediately made inquiries. Uh, and indeed, the band, the, the mill were finding it difficult to continue sponsoring the band. In fact, the band room was going to be put up for sale and the, there was a bid for a Chinese restaurant to be made from it. So th this was uh, quite uh, alarming news. So Donald uh, then put it to the board at Bradford and Bingley to give us some sponsorship but then, of course, there was the problem of the band room. And uh, there was a price fixed on it that Foster would sell it at. And so it was decided, um, and Donald Hanson, um, Trevor Lewis, Philip Duxbury, Geoffrey Lister, myself, Ian Thompson and James Watson, all put money in and bought the band room with a strict understanding that whenever the band had the funds, it could be bought for that same money back again. And that was how the band room was saved. Um, and it was through Donald's enterprise that that happened. And of course, as happens with all things, when you've got a gentleman running the proceedings, as Donald is and still is, um, it, the band grew from strength to strength. Uh, we did get, uh, James Watson came at the right time. He was a great conductor and it was, a good moment for the band because it lifted it. And of course, 1997 came and sponsorships um, start and they stop and they happen for different reasons and we didn't have the sponsorship. And at that time, I, I called at the band room in 1994 uh, to arrange a charity concert and Jim Watson asked me if I'd be administrator of the band, which I, I was sort of retiring then, so yeah, it, it was a good time to do it. And uh, I always had this thing that Black Knight Band had done a lot for me, so I thought perhaps here was a chance for me to do something back. Um, we, uh, we had successes and of course, as I say, in 97, we had no sponsorship whatsoever. Now, I, when I had my own business and etc., I've always been a strong believer in high profile. You, you cannot sell clogs and PR card and shoes in the same shop in my opinion. You've got to have a high profile and maintain that profile at all costs, uh, even though sometimes it might prove very difficult. We did maintain our profile, and I mean, I think it was 97, when for one reason or another, we couldn't enter the British Open Championship, they'd moved the date, um, we didn't qualify for Europe, we didn't qualify for the Nationals. And by not going to those three contests, saved Black Dyke Band a tremendous amount of money. In fact, I would go as far as to say that it was, particularly with no sponsorship, it probably was a big saviour for the band, financially. Um, we continue to do the concerts, and here is, is a question, uh, and I don't put it forward any stronger than that, that we continue to have 100% attendant concerts. In fact, at places like Bury St Edmunds, there used to be a, a return ticket queue in case anybody gave them back word. So we continued with the high profile concerts at Symphony Hall. We did with the Messiah, we did, we did the Planets, all through Jim Watson. And, and I'm pleased to say that that was probably our most successful time and we didn't go to any of the three major contests. I'm not saying we shouldn't go again, but it does prove a point that good concerts will bring customers in. Um, and, and we went through that, and I mean, uh, there were some tremendous wins uh, with contest wins, with you. there were some tremendous concert programmes. And, and I mean, one of the things that we got, we got an inquiry from Bermuda. Um, Peter Lloyd, a lovely fellow, he's, I think it was his daughter, I can't remember now if it was a daughter married a Yorkshireman or, or his son married a Yorkshire girl, but he'd seen the band advertised at a concert in Harrogate. <clears throat> so we started uh, letters to each other and talking on the phone, etc. And after 12 months, he arranged for Black Dyke Band to go and play in Bermuda in February. Well, somebody's got to do it, you know, these rough jobs come along. And 
So we, we went to Philadelphia for a start and then flew from Philadelphia. And had an interesting thing there because when, when we were leaving Philadelphia, we had a, um, a box, big box like that, uh, and we used to put the stand banners in it and all sorts of things. And this rather officious American lady said, it's too heavy, you can't go. Well, there's, there's one flight into Bermuda on a Tuesday or Thursday, whatever it is, and there's one flight out. So I thought, oh, dearie me. And then a thought struck me. And as a young lad going to the College of Art in Bradford, we only did sport in summer, cricket. And we used to go on the bus up to Zebra Boys School and have a cricket practice. And we had a big equipment bag. And so what this particular day we went down and we had a particular smart teacher, Mr. Laycock, he'd been involved in the security during the war and secret service and whatnot. We got to the bus stand and they all started the bus away, go on at the back, but he put the thing under the steps and the conductor being a job that says, that's too heavy, get it off, you can't go. So oh, we're thinking, no. So the bag came off, so he opened the bag, former cue boys, so as get back on the bus, you carry that pad, you carry that wicket. You, so he distributed all the gear between the boys, four, 15 of us. Then he, so I think it's all right now. He put them so then I'm stood in Philadelphia airport with about an hour for the flight and 30 members there and all the rest of it. So I just opened the box and I think Brett Baker was the first one, the trombone player, I said, any room in your, yes, please. So, so I then started to proceed, rolled the banners up and gave each man to them and, and we got away. So, you know, things go around that come around, don't they? Um, but yeah, some memorable times. Um, and, and I have to say that when you do win at a contest, it is, it is a wonderful feeling, but it's also tremendous to see a standing ovation in Lucerne in Switzerland. 